One, two, three, four. Imagine a dedicated artist just days away from her first major gallery exhibition. A dream she's been nurturing for years. This is it. Finally, this is it. But as the opening night draws near, she is overwhelmed by a crushing wave of anxiety and doubt. In a bewildering turn of events, she cancels the exhibition, citing vague reasons, and just sits at home watching mindless reality TV. She feels a sickly comfort akin to relief at first, but is soon drenched in the bleak feeling that she gave up when she was so, so close. Now think of someone who's made significant strides in his fitness journey, transforming his lifestyle, tracking macros, and working towards his health goals. He's almost there. The weight he wanted to reach is just around the corner. But just as he's about to celebrate his success, he relapses into old habits. He starts skipping workouts, reaches compulsively for food delivery apps, and doubles down on unhealthy eating. Slowly undoing his progress, one justification at a time, one slip at a time, until he gains back all the weight he worked so hard to lose. Finally, envision a couple who seem to be made for each other. They just got engaged and they're making plans for the wedding, thinking about kids in a few years and dreaming of their future together. But on a perfect sunny day, when everything is going fine, they start bickering. This turns into a heated argument which escalates into resentful personal criticisms, then shouting, then screaming, then anguish, and finally, the dreaded words escape one partner's mouth. I think we should end things. And just like that, just on the brink of their life together, their shared dreams burst into nothingness. What if I told you that the common theme that runs across each of these three narratives is a subconscious desire to dissolve into inorganic matter? Wait, hold up. Yepi, did you make me click on this video just to make me sad with these heavy and strangely relatable vignettes and then hit me over the head with some psycho mumbo jumbo? Well, no, I promise you a happy ending, um, a positive ending to this rather bleak beginning. Just make sure you watch till the end. The idea of a death drive or an innate desire for destruction is most commonly associated with Sigmund Freud. And for good reason, as we'll see. But before we even start with Freud, we need to talk about three other psychoanalysts who were instrumental in the formulation of this idea. Wilhelm Steckel, Alfred Adler, and Sabina Spielrein. They were all students of Freud and separately laid down the groundwork for the idea that would one day become known as the death drive. Wilhelm Steckel was one of Freud's earliest followers. He often focused on the darker aspects of the human psyche in his work and he was particularly interested in understanding the unconscious motivations behind various forms of self-destructive behavior. He theorized that such behaviors could be traced back to subconscious drives and impulses, including a desire for the organism to return to a state of non-existence. He was the first one to use the term thanatos, to describe an innate force within us that seeks destruction, as opposed to Freud's idea of the eros, which is the force within us that seeks pleasure, procreation, and preservation. Now, coming to Alfred Adler, who was one of Freud's most prolific followers turned greatest intellectual hater. If you've ever used the term inferiority complex, you've referenced his work. Adler focused on the aggressive drives within humans in their pursuit of power and this influenced Freud's shift of focus, although he hated to admit it, into the darker aspects of human drives. And finally, the most key and historically most overlooked contributor to the idea of the death drive was Sabina Spielrein. Sabina was a Russian psychoanalyst, one of the first female psychoanalysts and a significant figure in the early stages of psychoanalysis. In her extremely metal-sounding paper, Destruction as the Cause of Coming into Being, Spielrein proposed that destruction is an essential and inevitable force in psychological development and transformation. She argued that destruction and creation are intimately linked, suggesting that the drive towards destruction is not solely negative, but also a necessary precursor to new creation and development. 
Now all these ideas were floating around him, but the stubborn Mr. Freud was either too dismissive, as he often was, or evasive in his appreciation. But then something happened that transformed his perspective. World War I broke out. At an analytical level, Freud noticed that soldiers would not only relive their traumatic experiences from the war in dreams, they would also be subconsciously drawn to circumstances that reminded them of their trauma, almost as if they wanted to be pulled back into the battlefield. This ran contrary to Freud's famous idea of the life instinct or eros. This was a strong pull in the opposite direction, towards danger and death. He could no longer deny that it was grossly insufficient to say that human behavior is primarily driven by the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. There was clearly something much darker at play. Emotionally, there was potentially another reason for Freud's turn to the darker side of human instinct. He was in pain. His sons Ernest and Martin were soldiers in the war and his family was under great stress. During this time, Freud wrote, I venture under the impact of the war to remind you that the evil impulses of mankind have not vanished in any of its individual members. Our intellect is a feeble and dependent thing, a plaything and a tool of our instincts and affects. And a few years later, Freud's favorite child, Sophie, dies of the Spanish flu. Freud was heartbroken but also deeply guilty that his daughter had died while he was still alive. He found this state of affairs to be monstrous, unbearable. And then in this intellectual and emotional context came the essay that would change psychoanalysis forever, beyond the pleasure principle. In this essay, Freud introduces the concept of the death drive as we know it today, challenging his own monodirectional view that human behavior is primarily driven by the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. For Freud, the death drive is an instinct within humans that compels them towards self-destruction and a return to an inorganic, non-living state where you don't have to do anything anymore. And just like that, Freud burns the dried husk of his own theory and brings forth a new paradigm. A dualistic picture of the psyche now emerges in his writing. The two instincts, the death instinct and the life instinct, in constant interplay within the human psyche, driving behavior and influencing mood and motivation. He now began to see even the drive towards pleasure as nested within a death drive and as a counterforce to it. The death drive is characterized by behaviors that may appear irrational or self-destructive, such as a compulsion to repeat traumatic events, the impulse to sabotage your own happiness, and the secret desire to withdraw back into the familiar comfort of something that's terrible for you. In other words, the organism struggles against events that might expedite its own good, its own life-affirming aims. According to the classical Freudian stance, the death drive can manifest as external behaviors such as sudden aggression or risky behavior, addictive patterns and compulsively seeking out traumatic experiences and circumstances. But all too often, it shows up as extreme inaction or withdrawal from participating in life and activities or squandering away chances to feel connected to life, your goals and the people around you. On one hand, life's call to adventure is confused with the impulse to jump headfirst into the void. On the other hand, life's call to adventure is refused out of the fear of the vital unknown and in favor of the familiar rut. Opportunities are perceived subconsciously as dangers, commitments are perceived as condemnations. The dark cold comfort of inertia feels more inviting than the light to which we are not yet accustomed. When Freud published his idea of the death drive, it was immediately accepted by everyone and it wasn't controversial at all. Kidding! Despite a few important supporters down the line like Melanie Klein and Eric Byrne, Freud's theory was met with skepticism and criticism which only mounted as psychoanalysis declined and modern clinical and experimental psychology ascended. 
The empirical basis of the debt drive was questioned and its status as a universal drive behind human behaviors was debated down, relegated to the tiniest silos of applicability. And just like with pretty much everything Freud ever proposed, we've torn the idea of the death drive to shreds, finding a teeny bit of validity in some discrete areas of study and leaving just large gaping holes and limitations in our wake. But I think there's something incredibly valuable in there that's been thrown away with the bathwater and it feels like it's come back to haunt us. The millennial obsession with memes about death and decay, jokes about being in rotting eras and the socially mediated narrative amongst young people of being mere pawns in forces beyond our control all the time so what's the point? All these may be clues that there is an ongoing resurgence and preoccupation with death-like inertia. And I think we need better symbols to help us psychologically organize and make sense of the desire for this inertia. I don't care very much about whether the death drive is an immutable universal psychological principle or not. I care about whether we can use it as a symbolic marker to identify and understand the self-sabotaging behaviors that we unwittingly participate in. And I really care about using this understanding of our darker impulses to mitigate their damage and move forward in life with confidence. And indeed, Freud himself didn't think of the death drive as an actual desire to experience death. In fact, he thought that since the state of non-being could not be truly experienced, it's not death itself, but what death symbolically represents in the unconscious mind that was at the core of the death drive. And what is one of the things death symbolically represents, perhaps more than anything else? A state of complete inactivity and non-participation. From this perspective, I think the death drive is an excellent conceptual tool to make sense of that impulse we have from time to time to relinquish conscious creative control over our own lives. Specifically, it's useful to make sense of the death drive as a cyclical temptation to give up our own self-authorship rights and responsibilities. So what do I mean by self-authorship? Coined by the developmental psychologist Robert Keegan, self-authorship is the conscious effort to feel like you are the author of your own life's narrative by making deliberate choices and taking actions that align with your values, goals and aspirations. And doing this for long enough that your values, goals and aspirations take on a sort of identity in themselves, becoming an internal guiding light that helps inform your choices and actions. Integral to self-authorship is a continuous process of self-directed reflection, decision-making and action, which slowly builds a long-term vision of who you want to be. In this framework, the death drive acts as a counter-narrative to self-authorship, representing an underlying pull towards passivity, inaction, pessimism, shame of success, and ultimately the desire to surrender authorship rights over your life story to these feelings. This manifests in behaviors that undermine self-authorship, such as self-sabotage, chronic procrastination, avoidance of challenging but necessary tasks, and a general reluctance to step out of one's comfort zone. It is a temptation to surrender to a force that opposes the self-directed momentum of life. In every life, there is an inherent narrative tension between comfort and growth, between ease and effort, and consciously choosing to steer your life towards meaningful objectives and values or not. This choice is not a one-and-done type of deal. It's a continuous process of negotiating with and overcoming the pull of the metaphorical death drive again and again. Embracing self-authorship means acknowledging that while we may not have control over many aspects of our lives, we do have control over how we respond to life's challenges. It's about moving away from a victim mentality which frames you as the unwilling hostage to life to a self-authorship mindset where life is something we can actively shape and influence. In doing so, we counteract the death drives narrative of passivity and surrender. Instead, we choose a path of active engagement and purposeful direction. Now then, let's talk about ways to escape the grip of the death drive that you might find yourself in from time to time. There is no one-size-fits solution, first of all, but 
there are four ways I found to be really powerful and exceptionally powerful when developed together. The first way is going to make me sound like a broken record to the people who've been following me for a while, but it's mindfulness. Yep, good old mindfulness. Mindfulness is the practice of being fully present and engaged in the moment. It is a fundamental way to affirm life by becoming better at being present in it. It involves a conscious effort to observe your thoughts and feelings without judgment, anchoring yourself in the present rather than being swayed by past regrets or future anxieties, which are the usual breeding grounds for self-destructive narrative swings in people's lives. Mindfulness can truly transform how you interact with your self sabotage thoughts because you start recognizing these thoughts as mere mental impressions rather than imperatives to action. This awareness creates a space between impulse and action. And in this space, you can pause and make choices that are better for you. It also enhances the appreciation of life's simple pleasures. It helps nurture a sense of gratitude and wonder for the everyday and counter the nihilistic undercurrents of the death drive. Imagine being able to be like, my death drive seems to be on right now and I understand why it's on, but I don't need to react to it. I just need to acknowledge it and sooner or later it will pass. Well, mindfulness is an exceptional way to get to that place. If you're an overthinker like I used to be and believe that mindfulness and meditation is for everyone else, every other human being in history but you, you special little snowflake, I have linked a free copy of a tiny ebook I wrote called Mindfulness for Overthinkers in the description. Feel free to download it and see if you can't find at least one technique that doesn't stick or get you in through the door. The second way to counteract the death drive is something I call when you think of the next thousand steps, just take the next single step principle, which is not very catchy. So let's just call it the next step principle. Very often, the journey towards our goals can seem daunting, overshadowed by the low resolution, spooky mental image of the thousands and thousands of steps and potential obstacles that lie ahead, or some hazy vision of finally fulfilling your dreams only to be cancelled for saying something stupid. Ugh. This is an overwhelming perception and it can feed into the dead drives narrative, leading to paralysis by analysis, where the fear of what might be impedes any action at all. The antidote to this paralysis is to focus on taking just one step. This approach is about breaking down the journey into manageable parts and focusing on the immediate next action you should be taking rather than ruminating about the entire path. It's about acknowledging that while the final destination is important, it is the steps taken towards it that truly matter. Each step, no matter how small, is a defiance of the inertia proposed by the death drive. It's an active choice to move forward, to grow and to evolve. And by concentrating on the immediate next action, the next brush stroke for an artist, the next sentence for a writer, the next stride for a runner, we engage in a process that is inherently life-affirming. The third way is kind of a classic tool for self-authorship and that is to write down your values, goals and long-term vision. It's like creating a personal constitution. This sets out a clear, tangible framework of your core beliefs and aspirations and acts as a guiding document in life's journey. Writing down your values and goals helps make them clear. And when you make them clear, you give them the best shot of becoming real. Your personal constitution should stop you from acting against what you really stand for and take action on the things you really want. It helps reduce the gap between your real and ideal self. And when you map out your vision for a future that matches your goals and values, you gain direction. You're better equipped to guide your everyday decisions towards a life that's meaningful and true to you. The principles you note down in your personal constitution should be decisive enough to guide you, but just flexible enough to be open to amendment if needed. 
This gives your life a conceptual and symbolic spine which can help withstand the pull towards self-defeating inertia. It is a personal charter and stronghold against the grip of the death drive. I work with people to create personal constitutions. So if you're interested in doing that, drop me an email. My email is in the description as well. And finally, the fourth way, which may be the most important block for most people against self-authorship. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself while holding yourself accountable. Even if you took a hundred steps back under the grip of the death drive, you can still take one step forward, no matter how small. But in order to do this, you must forgive yourself and clear the way for yourself to move ahead instead of beating yourself up and holding yourself hostage to shame. Accountability is checking in regularly with yourself to see if something is working or not. It is not driven by shame, it's driven by transparency. Forgive yourself and remain accountable to yourself. Not only are they both possible, they are both absolutely necessary. So, now that we've covered the death drive, its history, its current relevance as a symbolic tool to make sense of our downward spirals, and some ways to overcome its grip so that we may move closer to self-authorship, there's only one thing left to do. Let's give our protagonists from the start of the video their positive endings. So remember the artist who cancelled her exhibition? She turned on the lights in her living room, she turned off Netflix and began to write a personal constitution, a set of guiding values to steer her life and career. Among these values, she identified courage over comfort as a guiding star. This new perspective empowered her to face her fears head on. She rescheduled her exhibition, this time she approached it with a renewed sense of purpose and bravery. She did feel similar feelings of inertia and withdrawal just before opening night, but she opened up her personal constitution and reminded herself of her own strength and resolve. The opening night was a triumph, not just of her artistic talent, but of her newfound determination to choose courage over the path of least resistance. What about the man who gained back all the weight he lost? He decided to take a different approach. Instead of sinking into a cycle of guilt and self-flagellation, he chose to focus on taking the next step. He acknowledged the destructive slippery slope he went on without harsh judgment and reminded himself that progress is not linear. With renewed determination, he began setting small achievable goals instead of fixating on his final goal weight. Each day, he renewed his commitment to making healthier choices, whether it was a short walk or choosing a healthier meal. Slowly but steadily, he regained a sense of control. He realized that the journey wasn't about perfection, but about persistence and resilience. By simply taking the next step again and again, he found his way back to his path, a more sustainable path, and reached his health goals with a deeper understanding and appreciation for the journey. And finally, the couple. What happened to the couple? In the aftermath of their explosive argument, the couple found themselves at a crossroads, their future together hanging in the balance. It was then they decided the importance of taking a mindful pause before giving in to destructive emotions and spirals. They decided to seek counseling on communication and emotional regulation. Through this process, they learned the art of the mindful pause taking a moment to breathe and reflect before responding in heated situations. This new approach transformed their relationship. They became more patient and understanding with each other, learning to express their feelings without letting anger and resentment take over. Their commitment to self-forgiveness and accountability paved the way for a stronger, more resilient partnership. They focused not on the grand image of being the perfect couple, but allowing space for flaws and imperfections with kindness and patience. The wedding when it happened was not just a celebration of their love, but also of their growth as individuals and as a couple, ready to face life's challenges together with grace and understanding. They still argued, but they got better at pausing, exercising restraint, and giving grace when they sensed that strange pull 
to go down a destructive spiral so those are our positive endings as promised speaking of which we have arrived at the end of this video thank you so much for joining me on this narrative journey please do subscribe it truly helps and share this video with someone who may enjoy it and i'll see you in the next one